Uh, good morning. Um, before we start with um, methodology two, today's subject, uh, there are a few leftovers from uh, last, uh, last lecture. So I'll go through them very quickly. I have a lot of slides to go through today, so apologies if everything goes a bit quickly. Um, so this is where we left it last, uh, last week. Uh, actually Monday, where we left it on Monday. Uh, I talked about error bars and I talked about statistics for machine learning experiments. And I made the distinction that um, you can do statistics for two reasons. You can do statistics to show confidence. So you have a measurement of your, uh, let's say, your accuracy or something like that. Um, you can show how confident that measurement is, how close you think uh, to the truth it is, or you can show spread. You can show, and these are related things, but you can show if I were to do the experiment again, what, are the, what is the probability that I would get a different outcome? Um, so we talked about confidence already in last lecture. Standard error and um, confidence intervals are measures of confidence, but if you want to show spread by itself, uh, you want to show standard deviation. And that's essentially to communicate to the reader, uh, we've introduced this model and it works uh, pretty well. It get, gets this accuracy or this area under the curve score. Uh, the reader will probably want to know what if I do the exact same thing you did, what are the probabilities of me getting a different outcome? What is the spread? Uh, and there are uh, different ways, different reasons you can get a different outcome. Firstly, if you um, sample a new data set from the same source, you would get a slightly different outcome because the data would be slightly different. Uh, but also sometimes in your, algorithm that, uh, in your algorithm there are sources of randomness. For instance, if you do gradient descent, you have to pick your starting point. And depending on the starting point you pick, you either end up in a local optimum or a global optimum, as we discussed last week in this uh, room. So that choice of initial uh, of starting point for your gradient descent algorithm affects the outcome. And if you repeat the experiment, you might get a different outcome. So for that reason, you want to show spread. You want to show this randomness. So when you're showing this, uh, it's always important to describe what you repeat. So what if you repeat it over different runs of the algorithm? Um, picking different initializations for gradient descent is easy. That's not a problem. Sampling your data, resampling your data, that is a problem. Usually you just have only one data set and you don't have access to the source of this data. You can't just sample a whole bunch of new uh, digits or, uh, or whatever data set you use. Um, but there are a few ways to slightly trick this and to get some sense of what your spread is, uh, which is essentially resampling your data. So you look at your data and you resample from it. You sample from it another data set. This is essentially what we did in cross-validation, uh, where we chunked our data set into chunks of uh, usually 80% uh, training set and 20% validation set. So you can do this on the whole data set and repeat it and get a measure of, of how um, different the results are. So then you get five experiments on five different data sets or largely different data sets. Uh, and that gives you an indication of how much variance there is in your, uh, in your algorithm. Uh, there's something called stratified cross-validation uh, where you can uh, uh, tweak it so that the class proportion stays the same in all folds, which is usually gives you better results. Uh, and if you have a very fast algorithm, you can actually do a kind of extreme cross-validation where you're Val uh, where your validation set is only one example. So you test all the examples in your training set and for every example you test on the whole of the rest of your uh, data. So if you have 100 examples in your training set, you do 100 runs of your algorithm, leaving only one example out at each run and then you average the classification error. So it's a sort of very extreme uh, cross-validation which is fine if you have a very fast algorithm, but usually it's not applicable for us. Uh, what you can also do is uh, bootstrapping. Uh, 
And in bootstrapping, you don't cut your data into slices, into these folds for cross-validation, but you resample your data with replacement. So if you have a data set of 100 points, you sample from it uh, with replacement 100 points. So you sample a point, put it back, sample a point, put it back, until your sample data set also contains 100 points. Some of which will be repeated, will be in there multiple times, and some of them will be in there only once, and some of them may not be in there at all. Usually, about 63% of your data set uh, will be included, and the rest will be duplicates. The nice thing is, if you do bootstrapping, uh, that you can sample from your, uh, well, from uh, a fake data distribution as much as you like, so you can repeat the experiment as often as you like. Um, you will have duplicate instances in your data set, instances that are exactly the same, which for some classifiers like k-nearest neighbors kind of screws up their performance. Some classifiers don't mind. For linear uh, regression, it doesn't matter. For k-nearest neighbor, it, it kind of screws things up. Uh, for small data sets, this can give you better performance. So this is also a way to repeat your experiment to get an indication of spread. So what did we, uh, what's the, the main thing that we learned about statistics, about using statistics in machine learning? Is not to worry too much about it. Um, it's not, yeah, I, I can't really, especially for the project, uh, I can't really ask you to do very thorough statistical analysis if it doesn't really happen in the research community either. Um, but think about what you want to claim and what analysis is required for that claim. So in certain situations, if you have, for instance, a very small test set, then you do need to worry about these things. And then statistics uh, comes into play. So don't worry about it until you have to. Um, good question. The question is, when do you define your test set as small? Um, I would look back at the lectures from, from Monday. I showed this plot of confidence intervals for test sets of different sizes. Um, and what we saw there is that, let's say, if you have a, a, an accuracy, if your true accuracy that you're trying to measure is 0 0.5, uh, if you have a test set of a, a size 100, your confidence interval is between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. Uh, so that's quite big. That's quite a big range. It's very difficult to distinguish classifiers then. Uh, for 1,000, it's, I don't remember, something like 1% uh, on either side. And for 10,000, it's below 1% on either side. Um, so if you're doing something serious, I would say you need 1,000 at least. And 10,000, you're safe. Uh, but that's not always easy to come by. Uh, so that's uh, all I'm going to say about statistics. Um, so all of this is about the question, which classifier is better? Which is, uh, if I have two classifiers, k-nearest neighbors and linear regression, or linear classification, which of those is better for my data? Um, but that leads some people to ask the question, which one is better in general? What is the best classifier? Uh, is there a kind of uber classifier that always works better or uber learning algorithm that always works better than others. Uh, this question was studied by Volpert and McReady. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And they came up with what's called the no free lunch theorems. There are a couple of them for classification and for optimization in general. And they summarized it like this. Any two, optimizations alg any two optimization algorithms so you can fill in classifier or regression or anything, are equivalent when their performance is averaged across all possible problems. So no is their answer. There is no single best classifier. At least not when you look at the set of all possible learning problems. Let's look at an example, which shows how weird this is and how unusual and how counterintuitive this is. Let's say we have two methods. A and B, k-nearest neighbors and uh, linear classification. And we do what we talked about at length in Monday's lecture. We do cross-validation. So we do cross-validation with A, we do cross-validation with B, and we see which one gets the better score, and we pick that one, right? 
That's method C. That in itself is a learning algorithm. It's completely defined. We don't have to use any intuition. We can just run that as a computer script. So that in itself is also choosing between A and B in that way is also an algorithm. We can also take the opposite algorithm. Very counterintuitively, we run uh, cross-validation. We see whether A or B does better, and we pick the one that does worse. So this is sort of anti-cross-validation anti method D. We pick the algorithm that does the worst. So what Wolpert and MacReady say is that for these two methods, there are as many learning problems where C beats D as there are where D beats C. If we make no assumptions a priori about our learning problem, then we don't know whether we should do cross-validation or anti-cross-validation. Which is very odd, because cross-validation makes a lot of sense and everybody uses it all the time. And anti-cross-validation makes no sense and nobody in their right mind would use it ever. But the theorem says, uh, if you don't know anything about your data, literally don't know anything about your data, you don't know which one is better. So how do we square the circle? What, uh, what does this mean? Well, um, we don't really know. But the best guess, or the best thing I can tell you, is that there is a kind of universal distribution. There is a kind of uh, common property to all the data sets that we are likely to see. And uh, there are certain properties of data that we will never, ever see. So a data set for which method C works is the kind of data set that we see a lot. In fact, almost all the data sets for which method C works, we, uh, al almost all the data sets we see are those for which method C works. And the kind of data set for which method D works, we almost never see. In fact, we never ever see. So there's a kind of universal distribution behind our data. Uh, or in another way, the universe generates data for us, or we select, gen select data sets, which are maybe compressible, maybe simple in some way. There's a lot of philosophy and theory behind this, but not a lot of uh, straight answers. Or rather, you can also say maybe the universe doesn't select it for us, but we select from all the available data. If we have a data set where cross-validation doesn't work, that basically means it looks random to us. So it doesn't look interesting to us. We don't really know what to do with it, so we ignore it. And the only data sets we don't ignore are the ones that we can actually analyze. Um, so that's a no free lunch theorem that doesn't tell us anything about daily practice. It doesn't tell us anything about which algorithms we should choose uh, because it only holds under this very unrealistic uh, assumption that all data sets are equal and that all data sets are equally likely. But it has led to something called the no free lunch, which I will call the no free lunch principle, which is not a theorem, but which is the general idea that um, even if there is this kind of universal distribution, we still don't really have a single best learning algorithm. So if you have a data set, you still have to try and you still have to test and you can't say, well, linear classification always beats k nearest neighbors. Um, you have to try and see whether it works. The closest I think we have to a universal learning algorithm is uh, cross-validation or testing on a validation set. Um, so kind of meta-learning and just trying all the algorithms in sklearn. That's the best we can do at the moment. Uh, and that sort of works even though, according to the no free lunch theorem, it shouldn't always work. But in general, in machine learning principle, it makes, uh, in machine learning practice, it makes no sense to talk about the single best learning algorithm. So, that's the leftovers. Um, on to the uh, second uh, lecture of this week. And like I said on Monday, we are going to talk this week about what happens outside the basic machine learning, so uh, the basic machine learning recipe. So we assume that we have picked a model and we have picked a, a way to search for it. Uh, 
Um, on Monday, we talked about what comes after. How do you analyze your results? How do you set up an experiment to choose between classifiers? Today, we're going to talk about what happens before. Specifically, how do you choose your instances? How do you choose your features? How do you prepare and clean your data? And, um, well, no, and how do you prepare and clean your data? And that's it. This is the plan. Uh, so we start with some simple practical steps, which are very important for your project, more than for the exam. So this is what you should be doing to your data in the project, how you should be treating it. Then once you have a clean data set, uh, maybe it comes with a basic list of features, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't come with things that are readily, that you can readily feed to a machine learning algorithm. So how do you get features out of it? And even if you have features already, you can usually tweak those features to make them a bit better. And we talk about data normalization. Briefly, then we talk about a kind of ultimate form of data normalization called principal component analysis. This one's going to be a bit technical and a bit in depth. So if you have your limited mental energy on this morning, save it for the principal component analysis. And then I'm going to show you some examples of how powerful principal component analysis is, what you can do with it, and why I put you through this horrible uh, explanation of this method. And the most exciting one of that is called eigenphases. So that's uh, what we'll end on. Uh, it's often said that... Um, about 80% of uh, data science is cleaning up your data, getting your data and cleaning it, and about 20% is actually doing machine learning and doing analysis on it. Um, so I figured I should at least briefly discuss the main points of uh, cleaning data, which is missing data and outliers. So let's start with the missing data. Here's a basic data set with one numerical feature and two categorical features. And as you can see, some values are missing. That's all. That's, and that happens a lot uh, in natural data. It's very rare to see data that is actually complete. So if you get a data set like this, what do you do? I mean, the, ex the classifier that you're going to apply to this or the regression algorithm expects all your features to be complete, and they're not. So you need to deal with it in somehow, in some way. Um, simplest way to do that is to just remove the feature where the uh, items are missing. So remove the column in this data matrix. That's very easy. Uh, but it can also mean you're throwing away a lot of data. So if the column is not important, just chuck it out. But if you think, well, this might be important, or if there are features missing in all columns, then you can do that. You can also remove the instances. So remove the rows where there are features missing. But then you, there you have to think about whether or not the data is missing uniformly. So these gaps, the process that created these gaps, uh, is it equally likely to select every single one of these things to delete, to corrupt? Or are certain areas of the data more likely to be missing than other areas of the data? For instance, if you're taking phone surveys, uh, then your missing data might be people who refuse to answer a certain question. And some people are more likely to refuse to answer certain question, uh, to answer questions than others. Uh, so possibly at a guess, maybe people with higher income are less likely to share information. Uh, something like that. So that creates a bias in these missing values. 
which means that if you remove the rows with missing values in them, you are changing the distribution of your data. You are removing all these rich people from your data, and you're changing the distribution. So you don't want to do that. So you have to have a look at it and see if you can figure out somehow whether the distribution of this missing data is uniform or not. And there's a sort of general principle that I think you should always refer to when you are dealing with a data science thing like this and you're not sure what to do, you're not sure how to go about it. And that is always to think about the real world use case behind this pipeline. Even if you're not building a production system, you are simulating a production system. You are building something that might be used in a certain uh, environment. So, so long as you're building something useful, it's, u uh, it's useful for something, so you can imagine how it might be used by someone. So think about that scenario, and think about that person, and think about what they need. So in this case, it's very important to ask yourself, in this production system that we may or may not be building, but assume that you get a good classifier and it's going to be deployed somewhere, it's going to be used, is that classifier also going to get missing values? Or is it just our training set? And once we go into production, we can be sure that there are no missing values. If the classifier also gets missing values, then your system as a whole needs to be able to deal with that. So either you need to remove them somehow in an automatic way, so you can't just eyeball it and say, well, I'm going to fill these in. The system that fills in the missing values needs to be automatic, so you can run it in production as well. Or you leave them in the data and train the classifier to deal with them. This is especially easy if you have categorical features. Then you can just make missing answer another category. <coughs> um, if you can be sure that once the system goes into production, you get uh, there won't be any missing values. For instance, if it will go into a web form, and you can make all the entries uh, obligatory entries, so people can't click submit until everything's filled in. You know there won't be any missing values. Then you should get a test set that simulates that scenario. You should get a test set that is uh, relevant, that is representative for that scenario, and then test on that. Uh, so the question is under which, uh, yeah, so uh, what's the opposite? What kind of production system would get, would get missing values? Um, let me think. Um, well, if you're taking, for instance, a, a measuring app, um, if you're taking measurements with a um, machine that isn't quite reliable, um, then you would get miss missing values. Or if you're in production also working on survey data, so then it's not really a production system as you're imagining like an actual server or machine that's running, but you might still be running your new data through a machine learning classifier which can also be gathered through a phone survey or uh, on the street. Um, if I come up with a better example, I'll include it in the slides. Um, but if you don't, then you can get a test set that is representative for a situation without missing values. So you should find a way to get a test set without missing values. So you can accurately test uh, whether or not the, the way you choose to fill in these uh, missing values actually works. So if you come up with some way to fill these missing values in, then you want to test wh whether it works, which method is better. So then your test set shouldn't have missing values, otherwise you can't test it, right? Um, filling in the missing values, guessing their values is called imputation. Simplest ways to do it, if you have categorical data, just use the mode, so just use the uh, most uh, frequent uh, category. If you have numerical data, use the mean or the median. Uh, and if you want to be a bit more fancy, if you want to be a bit more uh, accurate about it, you can actually make this feature with the missing values in it a target in another model. So you can look at all the other features and try to predict the data. So if I look at this, these are all features now, but I can just train another model where this is my target uh, class, 
and this is the feature. I can't use this as a feature because then I have missing values again. So I can use only use the complete features. Uh, but then I can do imputation with a bit more uh, with a bit more power. But it's also a lot more work, and you have to really test it. Oh yeah. So uh, and if you get it tested without missing values, this is easy to do if they are uniform. If the values are missing uniformly, then you just sample some rows that don't have missing values in it, and that will be your test set. But if they're not uniform, then if you do that, you will uh, get a skewed distribution again. So then you need to be a bit more clever. But that's outside the scope of today's lecture. Outliers is kind of the um, opposite of missing values. Outliers are the values that you would like to be missing, the values that you would maybe consider removing from your data in order to uh, make it work better. So if you see something like this, this is very natural, a little bit chaotic, but it follows a pattern. And here we have five, uh, six points all in a row with a very unnatural and very specific value of minus one. So that kind of indicates maybe a measuring problem or maybe somebody who had missing value and didn't know what to do with it, so set it to minus one. So if you have outliers like this, then clearly, well, clearly, then you need to do something with it. You can remove them from your data, or you can treat them as missing values. If you have outliers like this, so here's an income distribution, and here are all the normal people who make normal amounts of money, and you get a few rich people all the way at the end who make insane amounts of money. And in some sense, they are outliers because they are far away from the real distribution, far away from the mean. But they are part of the data distribution. They are part of your, of the natural way that income is distributed, whether you like it or not. So this kind of thing you want to keep. The only thing it tells you is that your data is not normally distributed. Uh, here's another example to show the difference if your uh, classes are images. This is clearly a mistake. This is just some technical error. So throw that out. And this is an example of an extreme case of your data distribution. So this comes from your data distribution, but it's on the extreme end. So those ones you want to keep in, because they tell you a lot about your distribution. So here's a plan for dealing with outliers. First of all, ask yourself, are they mistakes, or are they part of the distribution? If they're mistakes, deal with them. If not, leave them be, but check your model for assumptions of normality. So under a normal distribution, this would never happen. If income were distributed normally, then there would be, let's say, extreme uh, cases, somebody with a million dollars, and then a very extreme case, somebody with two million dollars, and then a very, very, very extreme case, one, somebody with uh, three million dollars, but never anybody with four million dollars. That's how normal distributions work, right? You can see people with two me uh, who are two meters tall. You might see somebody who's three meters tall, if you look throughout the whole of history and the whole of the human population, and you will probably never ever see anybody for as long as humanity is alive who is four meters tall. And five meters tall is physically impossible. But that's not how income works. Most people have maybe a thousand uh, euros or 10,000 euros, and then you'll see some rich people with 100,000 euros, some very rich people with a million euros. And then in Europe, there will be plenty of people with 10 million euros and 100 million euros. If you look at the world, there will be people with a billion euros and 10, maybe even 100 billion. So it works completely differently. And if you assume a normal distribution here, it's going to screw up your model in lots of uh, very problematic ways. So you should check whether your model assumes normality anywhere. And again, think about production. Can you expect these kind of glitches in production? If so, then the model needs to deal with them inside the model. So you either need to recognize them automatically and remove them or work them into the model. If not, remove and make sure that your test set represents the production situation. A um, little bit more about this normality. Squared error is linear regression. So mean squared error linear regression has an assumption of normality. 
which means that outliers are very have a very strong effect on this uh, squared uh, squared errors. Uh, if you want to get rid of this, you need to model the noise with a heavy-tailed distribution, which is also outside the scope of uh, this lecture, but that's what you need to do. And remember, whatever you try to, whatever you decide to do and whatever you try, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And just test everything you come up with on a test and validation set, test or a validation set, and see which works better. So you don't have to be right. You just have to be right enough to get a better uh, validation score or a better test score. So, features. Uh, that's all about data cleaning. Uh, once you start on your project, you download your data set from Kaggle or from the UCI repository. You might get something like this. It looks a lot like a machine learning data set. But it actually has a few features that are not quite features as we're used to them, like dates or phone numbers. So what to do with those? Let's start there. Um, so you have a couple of uh, feature types that, do, that are not readily consumable by machine learning algorithms. And depending on which machine learning algorithm you choose, you need to uh, translate them either to numeric features to categoric features, or in some cases there are classifiers which accept both. So you can pick per feature which is easiest to um, translate to. Let's start with the uh, simple example age. Age is a numeric feature but it's in integers usually, so it's only whole numbers. Um, if you translate that to a numeric feature you turn it into real valued numbers, there's not usually a problem there. You can just turn the integer 16 into the real value 16.0, and it all works fine. Uh, to, if you have to translate it to categoric data, that's a bit more tricky, and you need to come up with some way to bin the data. So you need to bin it into uh, distinct categories. For instance, two categories above or below the median for age seems to work fine. Um, basically, you're always losing information here. There's no way to avoid that. You're just going to lose information. But it might be worth it. If all your other features are categoric and this classifier that only uh, consumes categoric information that you've chosen works really well, then maybe you want to do this. You, maybe you want to take this hit. Here's a different one, phone number. Which you might think, well, that's sort of an integer as well. You can represent that as a number. If you do that, and you translate that to a numeric feature, it, does, it won't work at all. Not even a little bit. Because even though this might look like a number, and you might interpret it as a number, the ordering between the numbers is completely meaningless. If your phone number represents a higher number than my phone number, that doesn't tell you anything. That doesn't make you more likely to be a terrorist or doesn't make you more likely to buy a bottle of Coca-Cola than me. It contains no information. So mapping phone numbers to numeric features makes no sense. There's no machine learning algorithm in the world that's going to extract any information from that. But there is information in here. For instance, the area code in Dutch numbers, the first three letters, will tell you where somebody lives, or at least where their phone number is. So that's interesting information. That uh, will give you an indication of their age, of their uh, social status, all these things. Or you can see whether they gave you a landline number or a mobile phone number. You can also tell that from the phone number in the Netherlands. Um, so you can map those to categorical features and use those, which is much more interesting. What if your classifier only accepts numeric features? You still want to use the phone number? You can map to a category first and then map your categoric feature to a numeric feature. There are two ways to do that. So let's start with some weird basic uh, made up categorical feature like genre. So we have sci-fi, romance, comedy, thriller, etc. We can do that two ways. We can do integer coding. We just assign a random integer to each one. 
just or an arbitrary integer, I should say. We assign an arbitrary integer to each uh, category. But here we have the same problem again. This is a numeric feature. So the classifier is going to think that in some way, romance is higher than sci-fi, and comedy is higher than romance on this scale. And they're not, there is no ordering, it's just a set. So to really represent this as a set in numeric features for the classifier, the best thing to do is one-hot coding. So for each category, we make a new feature. So instead of one feature, we get four features. And we code them as zeros and ones. So per feature now, there is an, or there is an ordering that makes some sense. You can think of this as how much science fiction there is in this particular movie, either zero or one. But it still makes sense in terms of ordering. Uh, so we turn one categorical feature here into four binary numeric features. It's also called one of encoding. So the question is, uh, is this going to work? And that depends a lot on the classifier. So there's a big interaction between the classifier you use and the way you encode your features. Uh, and what they can do. So if you look at a linear classifier, for instance, what it can do is it can take each of these features and it can look at them independently. So if you're classifying whether um, somebody's going to like these movies, then you can say, well, the more sci-fi it is, the more he's going to like it, and the more romance it is, the less he's going to like it. But you can't combine the features. You can't say he's going to like romance, but only if it's comedy. And if it's romance and a thriller, then he's going to hate it. Here's another example. Uh, slightly contrived. So if you're doing spam classification, you have two features. One is the extent to which the email uh, mentions drugs. And one is the extent to which the email is sent to a pharmacy. Uh, these two are interacting features, right? So. Mentioning drugs usually means that it's spam, except when it's sent to a pharmacy, because then it's natural for people to talk about drugs. If it doesn't mention drugs at all, then it's usually not spam, assuming there's more spam than not spam. Unless it's sent to a pharmacy, when we would expect that the, all the emails mention drugs. That's slightly contrived, but just take my word for it and assume that it's the class distribution is exactly like this. Linear classifier is not going to know what to do with this. Right? You can't draw a line through this to separate the red from the blue. So why do I keep banging on about these linear classifiers if they're so limited? Because what we can do is we can add features to make the classifier stronger. In this case, here we have the extent to which the email uh, mentions drugs, the extent to which the email is sent to a pharmacy. If we just multiply the classifiers, you look at the signs, so two negatives make a positive, negative and a positive makes a negative. Um, then you can classify on this uh, feature. You can actually do this sort of classification, this, uh, what we saw here, this kind of classification. Because you just see whether or not, sorry, this third feature is positive or not. So if we train a classifier, on these three features in a three-dimensional feature space and visualize it back in the original two-dimensional feature space. Uh, oh, I have the wrong picture here. That's a shame. So you have to take my word for it. It does work. <laughs> so if you do this, then you get a perfect classification. Uh, have a look at the PDF afterwards. I'll put the proper picture in there. It works in regression as well. So here we have one uh, regression with one feature. And if we do linear regression on this data set, it's not going to look great, right? It doesn't really follow the data. Because this is a parabola, and parabolas uh, look different. Parabolas require a nonlinear relation. So if we add one feature, which is just this feature but squared, turn it into a 2D regression problem, 
and fit a, a, well, a plane through that instead of a line, then map that back to this space, we get this, we get a perfect fit. So essentially what we're doing is we're saying, this is our linear function, the green one, which is a function of one feature. It doesn't really work. This more powerful model does work because it has three coefficients and three parameters. So we can see that it is a different model, but we can also see it as a linear model with one extra feature, which is derived from our original feature. And that's interesting because we know linear models are easy to fit. Uh, here's another example. You can do this with a square. If you add two or three features, you get this. This is a linear classifier, but fit in a high dimensional space, in a five dimensional space, and then project it back. Uh, oh, sorry. Slightly abrupt ending, but that's all I had before the break. So after the break, we're going to talk about normalization, PCA, and eigenfaces. All right, have a seat. Let's get started again. Uh, a couple of things um, we uh, talked about during the uh, questions asked during the break that I'll briefly uh, mention for everybody. First up, I told you about these missing values and I told you about how important it is to figure out whether or not the values are missing uniformly. But I kind of cheated there by not telling you how to figure out whether or not the values are missing uniformly. Um, and I don't think there's any kind of um, hard and fast rule or test that will help you work that out. But one thing you can do is to look at the distribution of another feature and to see how, uh, how the missing values are distributed across that feature. So let's say we have some missing values we are looking at in, I don't know, phone number or whatever, it doesn't matter. We have another feature like income. So income is distributed roughly like this. Uh, if all your missing values are over here, then clearly your missing values are biased. You're only missing values for rich people. And if the distribution roughly follows the income distribution, uh, then you can, and you check a few features and you keep seeing this, then you are relatively safe assuming, in assuming that your uh, features are missing uniformly. So there's no hard and fast rule for how to do it. It's more of an art than a science, but you can do this kind of plotting just to uh, give you some insight. Another thing I talked about this um, adding features by combining your other features. I forgot to tell you this is a, called a cross product. Uh, and you can think very hard, look at your data and think very hard about which cross products you'd like to add or which functions of your features. You can also add the sign of a feature or uh, any function you like. Uh, you can think very hard about which features you would like to add. You can also add all cross products, which in this case would be d squared, d times p, and p squared. Just add all of them, see how it works. Because linear classifiers are very quick, so adding extra features is cheap. Uh, my computer is beach balling out there. Okay, data normalization. Imagine you have uh, a k-nearest neighbor classifier. So just to remind you, the k-nearest neighbor classifier to classify a point looks at the neighboring points and looks at the class that is most prevalent in that area and assigns that. Let's say you have a one nearest neighbor classifier, so it looks at only, only the very nearest point, just to make things simple. And you have two features. Year of birth, which ranges from about 1900 to 2000, and pupil dilation, which ranges from two millimeters to 10 millimeters. Uh, visually, these two are about the same distance away from the target point. Uh, so these are about the same. 
But if you actually compute the distance in this space, ah, damn it, sorry. If you actually compute the distance in this space, this one is 40 away, and this one is 0 0.02 away. So K and N is going to massively prefer this one just because pupils are so small and much smaller than years. But that's not a meaningful distinction, right? So to combat this, what you need to do is to normalize your data. And almost all classifiers require data normalization to work properly. Almost all machine learning models. This goes exactly the same for regression as well. Uh, the simplest normalization is just to rescale it linearly so that the whole of your data fits into the area between 0 and 1. What you do like this. So first you add x min. So this is x min, the smallest value of x. You scale everything, so you push everything up so that this guy ends up here. And then you squeeze everything back so that this guy ends up here. So you divide by the range. So you end up with this. Uh, and you do this for each feature separately and independently. So you extract a row from your column, you normalize it, and you put it back. And these kinds of things are easiest to do with pandas. So this is why the third worksheet teaches you pandas. Uh, so you can do these things very easily. Oh, sorry. Uh, ah, that's a good question. So the uh, question is, um, what if your data doesn't have the same range or the entire range that you expect in production? Um, or to put it differently, you're scaling on your data, uh, on your training data here, but the range in your test data is going to be slightly different, or the range that you encounter in production is going to be slightly different. Um, that doesn't matter that much. So if you scale your... if you take this scaling, this normalization, and you apply it to your test data, your test data is not going to be precisely between 1 and 0, like this, but it's going to be approximately in this range. And that's all we're looking for. All we're trying to avoid is this kind of problem. So it'll be fine. So you can just... Uh, you can just use these values from your training data and use those as standard values also in production, also for your test data. Another thing you can do that's called whitening is to normalize the mean and the standard deviation. So you take the sample mean and the sample standard deviation from your data and you scale your data so that the mean hits zero and that the standard deviation is one which is just you subtract the mean and then you divide by the standard deviation. And then it looks like this. And then your data is centered around zero, so uh, you get a, as many positive as negative values. And uh, everything, the mean is, uh, is zero. Uh, so here you're sort of assuming that your data is normally distributed. And you are transforming it back to a standard normal distribution. That's called whitening. It's also a very good option. So let's look at what uh, that looks like if you have two features. So on the top here, we have two features and we whiten them both. And what we see is this nice circular, normal looking distribution. Uh, and here we have a very different distribution, so we get a lot of variance along this axis and very little variance along this axis. And if we whiten both features, we can see that it looks the same. So you're sort of always reducing your data, or trying to reduce your data, to this kind of shape. Independent, uncorrelated features that are normally distributed with variance 1. So that's very nice. If we have correlated features, so there's a big skewed distribution and knowing the value of one feature is very useful in predicting the value of the other feature. They are correlated. Uh, and we whiten those, each 
independently per uh, feature, we get this, which is fine for some uh, things. You can do this and you can put this through a classifier and that's absolutely fine, but it's not qu quite what we want. So this is great normalization. But what we really want is to take this and to reduce it to something like this. So how do we do that? That brings us on to principal component analysis. So we have some uh, cloud of data, two features, cloud of data somewhere in space. And our question is, how do we transform this? How do we change, normalize the features, change the feature values, so that this data space looks like this? This data cloud looks like this. How do we transform this, given only the data, into this? Alternatively, we can ask a question the other way around. How do we take these axes and turn them into these axes? So here you see the x-axis is stretched out because we have a lot of variance in this direction. So we put a, an x-axis there with lots of stretched out steps. We have a little bit of variance orthogonal to that, so we put a y-axis there with very small steps. And in this coordinate system, in these axes, our data looks like a sphere. It doesn't now because it's stretched, but if we plot this in a one-on-one -on -one aspect ratio, our data looks like this nice spherical cloud. So we need some um, linear algebra to make this precise, to make it precise exactly what we're talking about. So step one. You probably know this already, but just in case, uh, summing vectors. So let's say we have two vectors, A and B. We want to sum them. Summing vectors happens very simply by taking the endpoint of one vector and putting it onto the, taking the starting point of one vector, putting it on the endpoint of the other vector, and then drawing a line from the starting point of one vector to the endpoint of the other. So the uh, blue vector C is the sum of the red and the green vectors. That's how you sum vectors. And this is actually, if you look at these uh, lines, these axes, this Cartesian coordinate system that we always draw, that we always use, in a sense, this is how that's constructed. So we get two basis vectors. We get two vectors that form the basis of our coordinate system. And then we express every point in terms of those two basis vectors. So here we have the basis vector red, which is one step in that direction, and green, which is one step in that direction. And then we describe the blue point. We are used to describing that as 3.2, 3, 3,2, by which we mean add three copies of the red vector to two copies of the green vector, like this. And that's the, the point where you end up. That's the blue point that we indicate by 3, 2. In algebraic terms, our red basis looks like this. It's 1, 0. Our green basis is 0, 1. And we express the point x as 3 times b, 2 plus 2 times b. Uh, 3 times b, 1, plus 2 times b, 2. Or 3, 2. So why does that matter? Why do we need to think of this as a kind of collection of vectors? Because we can choose our basis vectors differently, like this. We choose two random new basis vectors, this, this guy, the purple guy, and the orange guy. And we can also express our point in these basis vectors, in this coordinate system, which looks like this. So in the original coordinates, this is the B1 basis vector. This is the B2 basis vector, so not axis aligned, not as nice as, uh, as the other ones. And to express our point in the new coordinate system, we need to find some values here to multiply with B1 and to multiply with B2, such that we get 3, 2 in the old coordinate system. In this case, 2.5 and 
So this point, this blue point, can be expressed in the new coordinate system as 2.5, 0 0.5. 2.5 times this basis vector plus 0 0.5 times this basis vector. So this allows us to transform between two coordinate systems. So if we take this, uh, these basis vectors and we stick them into a matrix, so this is a matrix with one column B1, one column B2, then multiplying X prime, which is the point in the, uh, the new basis system, by B, will get us to the old system, will get us to our familiar standard basis, and doing the opposite, so multiplying x by uh, the inverse of b will get us to x prime. Now the inverse of b is a bit uh, annoying, a bit tricky. But luckily if we ensure that these two are orthogonal and both have length 1, both have unit length, so it's not the case here because this one is longer than 1 and this one is shorter than 1, but if we ensure that they have unit, one, uh, unit length, then we, what we call, uh, we call B an orthonormal basis. And in that case, the um, inverse is equal to the transpose. So we can do this mapping from B to standard by just multiplying by the transpose. So we multiply by B to go from the standard base to the new basis. We multiply by the transpose to go back. So that's very easy. So now we have a nice way to express these kinds of new coordinate systems, and we can make, uh, make it more sp precise what we're actually after. What we're after is, given some data, a new system of bases, a new basis, a new coordinate system, set of basis vectors that put the, uh, the axes of the new coordinate systems along the axes that are in some sense, uh, own to the data. Um, step one is to fit a multivariate normal distribution to this. So we all know the normal distribution, which has a mean and a standard deviation. Multivariate normal distribution is just a generalization of that to more than one dimension. So the mean now becomes a vector in this case, this point. And the standard deviation becomes something called the covariance matrix. And the covariance matrix tells us on the diagonal for each axis how big the variance is in that direction. So this value tells us how big the variance is in this direction. And this value tells us how big the variance is in this direction. And the off-diagonal element, 0 0.7, which are symmetric, so it's we really have only one off-diagonal element here, 0 0.7. It tells us how much correlation there is between this axis and this axis. So how much correlation is there between x and y? In other words, how skewed is the... Uh, no, that's not the right way to say it. How diagonally stretched is the data? Or how much does knowing this value help me to predict this value? That's a covariance. And these two parameters, mu and sigma, uh, they define a multivariate normal distribution, and they look like this. They look like these uh, sort of oval blobs of data if you sample from them. And we can fit a multivariate normal distribution to data in the same way that we fit a normal distribution to data. We just compute the sample mean by summing all the vectors in the data, dividing by n. Uh, and then if we compute uh, what I've called X here, a uh, mean center data matrix. So we make the data matrix, we stick all the uh, vectors as columns in one big matrix and we subtract the mean from all. So here we take this whole blob of points and we mean center it. So we move it up and to the left a little bit so that this point ends up here. We call that matrix X. And if we take X times its transpose and multiply it by this value, or divide it, so divide it by n uh, minus 1, then that's the, our sample covariance matrix. That's an 
unbiased estimator for the covariance of our uh, data source. So this is just a way to fit a multivariate normal distribution to our data. Uh, these um, covariance matrices are always a bit complicated. So one thing that I find very helpful in dealing with multivariate normal distributions is to think of them as transformations. So here we have here we have a standard normal distribution which has mean zero and as covariance the identity matrix. We'll look a bit. We'll see. Uh, what that means later, but basically you have a standard uh, normal distribution which we take as to, which we take to be the sort of standard representative, the, the nor standard normal distribution. And you can apply to this, there are some points missing, if you, you can apply this to this a um, linear transformation. So you multiply it by a matrix and you add a vector and you might end up with something like this. So that looks like this. So we start with n01. This is the standard normal distribution. We take a random variable x and we say it's distributed according to this standard normal distribution. Now we transform this standard normal distribution by some a and some t. We get a random variable y. And you can show that y is also normally distributed. And the parameters of this normal distribution for y are mean t and covariance matrix A times A transposed. To make this maybe slightly easier to think about, Imagine that you sample a point from the standard normal distribution, which is very easy to do. You just sample x from a single variate normal distribution, single variate standard normal distribution. So you put a normal distribution on this axis and you sample a point from it. A mean centered, uh, just the, the standard normal distribution with, center, uh, with mean zero and variance one. You sample a point from it. You do the same thing for this uh, axis. You sample a point from it. And this point is distributed, is sampled from this standard uh, distribution. If we now, let's call this x, if we now apply to x a transformation, some linear transformation, so we multiply it by some matrix, we add some value t, let's say that puts x here, uh, sorry, puts y here. Then that it, uh, this whole process of arriving at y is the same as sampling from this multivariate normal distribution. So it's sort of a different way of thinking about nor normal distributions. Which brings us back to our original problem. Why don't we, given some data, compute the sample covariance matrix and the sample mean, so we fit a multivariate normal distribution to this data, and then we find some s, some a, such that this holds. Because then uh, we know that this uh, distribution that we fitted to our data is, uh, uh, can be expressed is the result of fitting the standard normal, uh, transforming, sorry, the standard normal distribution by A. And then we invert that transformation to whiten the data. So if we fit S to the data, compute A, and then invert that transformation, we are transforming our, our data back to the standard normal distribution. That's what we're after. So why don't we do this? Well, we'd be missing a trick because we're one thing we're skipping here in this rebasing thing is that we're actually free to permute the axes. 
So if you change to another basis, you can flip the axis around. And here, we might map this axis to this axis, or we might map this axis to this axis. We can do both. If you do it like this, that happens sort of arbitrarily, probably which one is the closest. And actually, we can do something much more interesting there. But in order to do that, we need to talk briefly about eigenvectors. And I promise this will be worth it. I'm jumping around from topic to topic, but in the end it will all come together and we will get a method that allow, will allow us to do some very interesting things. So the eigenvector, if you have a transformation of your space, so you multiply your space by some uh, matrix A, and then you get something like this, maybe a little stretch and a little squeeze or a little rotation. Uh, and all the vectors in this space are going to get transformed. Like here we see a red vector and a blue vector, and they both get transformed. Some vectors get rotated and stretched, and some vectors only get stretched. And those vectors are the eigenvectors. So here the blue vector gets stretched a little bit, but the direction stays the same. That's the eigenvector. If you think of this as something in three dimensions, so let's say I'm a body in three dimensions, and uh, you can rotate me by multiplying me by a matrix, then this vector, if you rotate me, changes direction. So that's not an eigenvector. And this vector doesn't change direction. So that's the eigen an eigenvector of this rotation. In fact, the only eigenvector. You can have as many eigenvectors as uh, dimensions. Looks like this in um, algebraic terms. So u is an eigenvector if multiplying by u is the same as just multiplying u by a single scalar value. If multiplying u by a is the same as just stretching u, then u is an eigenvector. For some A's called scaling matrices, the eigenvectors are particularly nice because they are essentially the basis vectors. So if you just squeeze along the x-axis and along the y-axis, then these guys are your eigenvectors. These guys are the vectors that don't change uh, direction. Uh, if that's true, then you call it a scaling matrix, and scaling matrices have only values on the diagonal. They don't have anything on the uh, on the off-diagonal elements. They have zero uh, everywhere but on the diagonal. So the here, um, scaling matrices are very easy to deal with. So what if our transformation is not like this? It's not a scaling matrix, and the eigenvectors point in this direction. Well, then we can represent that transformation as a step, uh, as three different steps. We can transform, uh, we transform the picture so that the eigenvectors are aligned with the axis. We apply a scaling matrix and then we transform the picture back. Three steps. It looks like this. So if we have some transformation with these eigenvectors, and we can represent it as three steps. We rotate the image slightly so the eigenvectors are axis aligned. We apply some scaling matrix Z. Sorry, this should say Z. We apply some scaling matrix, and then we rotate the picture back. Why is that useful? Because this basically means that if we uh, apply these things to X, uh, we get x times ut times z times u. So x times this times this times this. So a times x, which is the transformation that we're after, is equal to u z u t times x. In other words, if we decompose our matrix A into the product of three matrices, where the first and second are each other's transpose, uh, 
The first is an orthonormal basis. So here, this, uh, this is a rebasi rebasing operation with uh, orthonormal basis vectors. And the middle one, Z, is a scaling matrix. So only has elements on the non-zero elements on the diagonal. Um, then that's called a singular value decomposition. So we just decompose our matrix into these two matrices, Z and U, such that this holds. And there's an algorithm to do this. You can search for matrices like this, or you can compute this with some algorithm. I won't go into that. Just trust me, you can do this. Uh, these are the requirements. Z is diagonal. U rep represents an orthonormal basis. If you do this, then the columns of U are the eigenvectors of A. The diagonal values of Z are the corresponding eigenvalues, which I guess I forgot to tell you. We call this the eigenvalue, the amount by which the vector stretches. So this one, remember this eigenvector, it has eigenvalue 1, because my arm's not getting any longer as I rotate. So the diagonal values of Z are the corresponding eigenvalues. And this is what's important, why we do all this, why we use this and not the other uh, way to do it. The diagonal of Z is sorted from largest to smallest. So we can talk about the first eigenvector, which is the vector that stretches the most, the eigenvector that stretches the most. How do we apply this? To our situation, well, we compute the uh, sample covariance. We assume that it can be decomposed into, into A times A transpose in this way. But we don't compute uh, A. This is just a bit of algebra. We express A using the singular value decomposition, which we can fill in here. So that gives us this. Uh, just a little trick, if you want to solve this thing on the right here, I should stand on this side for the camera. So let's say you have A times B and you want to take the transpose of that, so you want to move the transpose in side, you flip A and B around and apply the transpose to each separately. That's how you move a transpose inside brackets. That's what we do here. So these get flipped around, and then the transpose gets applied to each separately, which means that this one goes over there and gets transposed twice, so it stays the same. This one gets transposed, and the transpose of a diagonal matrix is itself, so that doesn't change either. So actually, this just doesn't matter, and we get just two singular value decompositions. Since U is orthonormal, or an orthogonal matrix, I should say. The transpose of U times U is the identity matrix, so these two disappear. And we see basically the same form of the singular value decomposition again. So the singular value decomposition of A is the same as the singular value decomposition of S, except we have two Zs, which just mean because Z are both diagonal matrices, you... Um, square the values on the diagonal. So all of this, what this leads up to, what this means is that you can just, if you want the singular value decomposition of A, which we were after, you can just take the singular value decomposition of S, and your eigenvalues will be slightly different. But that doesn't matter for our purposes. Because we're interested in the sorting of the eigenvalues, but not the magnitude so much. So, if you got about 25% of that, I'm very happy. Yeah. Uh, this one? Uh, no, you're not allowed to move this around. Because matrix multiplication is not commutative, I think is the word. So you're not allowed to change the order of matrix multiplication. Um, 
Yeah, so if you get 25% of this has arrived, then I'm very happy. Please have a look at the slides, have a look at the video to fill in the rest. The point of it all is a method called principal component analysis, which works like this. We take some data set, we mean center it, we compute the sample covariance S, we take the single singular the value decomposition of S, and we widen the data by using this U as our new basis, which looks like this. So we apply this new access system to our uh, data. And the nice thing is, because we have this ordering of these axes, we know that the first axis we get, the first basis, is the one with the highest eigenvalue. That means that the first basis is the direction in which our data has the most variance. And the second axis we get, the second eigenvector, second eigen, uh, is the, has the second biggest eigenvalue, which means that if you account for all the variance in this direction, you get the direction in which there is the most residual variance. The direction in which there is the most variance if you account for this variance with another axis, and so on for the other eigenvalues. Which means that if you uh, represent your data in this new uh, coordinate system, but you throw away some of the coordinates, so let's say you use only, in this case, only the first coordinate, in other words, you project your data onto this line and you use only the value on that line. You get a very good representation of your data in one feature. So you can do dimensionality reduction. This, the, if you project all your uh, values down onto this line, that is in essence the best way you can represent your data in one dimension uh, assuming you use a linear projection. Uh, just summing up the details, so PCA expresses the data in new coordinates aligned with the covariance. The first coordinate, also called the first principal component, is the line along which the data has the most variance. Second coordinate is the line along which the remaining variance is the highest, and so on. And if you represent your data by only the first one or two or three principal components, only the first uh, few of these axes, you get very good compression of your data. And that's principal component analysis. So let's have a look at that in action. You see it a lot in the literature um, in anatomy. So these are, uh, every dot in this axis is a bone I don't remember which bone specifically, but some bone of a primate or human being. And to normal people like you and me, these bones all look the same. I have absolutely no idea if I saw this or this. I don't even know which part of the body it comes from. I certainly couldn't tell that this is an orangutan and this is a bonobo. But to uh, an anatomist who, is, uh, who knows this stuff and who, who uh, is familiar with... Uh, monkey skeletons, uh, they will see that immediately. They will see, obviously, this is completely different from this. The problem is how to communicate that. If you find something new, let's say some Neanderthal bone or uh, some, some other hominid, and you say, well, this is interesting because it's much, more, it's much closer to orangutans than humans, but it's still humanoid. How do you express that in a way that doesn't say it's true because I can see it. How do you separate that from your ability to tell these bones apart? One thing you can do is you can take lots of measurements of lots of different bones. So all these bones have been measured in lots of different ways, lots of features, and then project it down to two principal components. And what you see then is that the gibbons end up here, the chimps and the bonobos end up here, the gorillas end up here, humans end up here, and if you, can f if you find a new bone and you measure it and you project it down to these same, uh, this same basis system, and you say it ends up here, then you can say, well, that's interesting. We found a bone that is exactly halfway between humans and orangutans, for instance. So this is why principal component analysis is very handy. <laughs>
Oh yeah, so the question is where does the data come from, which is a good point. Um, so we have lots and lots of bones from lots and lots of species. Uh, each point is one of those bones. And per bone we measure, say, a hundred different things. We measure the distance between these two bits and how long it is and how tall it is and et cetera, et cetera. We measure all these things. So we get long feature vectors per bone. So we get a big data set. And then we apply principal component analysis to that data set and project it down to these two principal components. And then you get this. Uh, might slightly run over time. So I'll go through this quickly. Uh, this is a European population where the DNA of a lot of people was measured for a certain markers. So we have, let's say, 100 DNA markers, and we measure it for lots of people. So again, uh, big data set, 100 features, all of these markers in your DNA, and uh, thousands and thousands of people for whom you've sequenced the DNA. If you project that down to two principal components, you get a point cloud like this. Uh, and this is the, the colors are added later. So the colors are not part of the analysis. This is just purely on DNA. You get this shape. And if you then color the shape by where the people you originally measured were from, you see that the first two principal components align with how far north they live and how far east they live. In other words, you get a picture of Europe. So the geography of our planet is encoded in our DNA, or the collection of our DNA. If I take DNA samples of uh, a few thousand people, and I send them to some aliens on the other side of the galaxy who have never seen our planet, they can get a rough idea of what the geography of our planet looks like, which is kind of magical. Final example which is where you can really see how magical PCA can, uh, can be, is eigenfaces. So we have here a data set of lots of faces. Uh, all pictures are 64 by 64 grayscale pixels. And they're pretty, for a face, facial data set, they're pretty nicely aligned. So the eyes are always in roughly the same place, and the mouth and the nose is always in roughly the same place, and the lighting is always roughly uniform. Uh, these are 400 images. Um, as I said, 64 by 64 pi uh, pixels. Um, if you put this code into Python, you can play around with this data set as well. Uh, all code for any picture I put on the slides is available in the GitHub, so you can get all my code to have a look at how I did it. Um, and as before, with, with images, we can turn these into feature vectors by just flattening it, by just taking every pixel value as one feature. So we get a big feature vector of 64 times 64, length 64 times 64. So uh, that's about 4,000. So big 4,000 dimensional space we get. And every picture is a point in that 4,000 dimensional space. So this whole data set is a cloud of 400 points in that 4,000 dimensional space. So we can do PCA on that. We can fit a multivariate normal distribution to that. Uh, this is the mean of that distribution. So in that 4,000 dimensional space, all these pictures, they have a mean. If I rearrange that into a picture again, you get this. Uh, the color is added. I, uh, uh, it's a grayscale picture. I just added a different color map. So we call that the mean face, not because it looks mean, but because it's the average face. And we can compute the eigenvectors. So we can compute the directions in which this data set changes the least and the most. And those we can plot back to pictures as well, right? We can rearrange them and make pictures of them. These are the first uh, 30 eigenvectors. So this is the first eigenvector, the second one, third one, fourth one, and so on. And... Um, I've colored it uh, blue for the positive values. So blue, if you apply this eigenvector, if you add this eigenvector to some picture, then the uh, 
I th think the oh, this is the other way around. So the blue, uh, the red pixels are going to get higher, more white. The blue ones are going to get more dark. So this is our new basis system, right? So th this is the vector that points in this direction, explaining most of the variance in our data set. We've just transformed it back to an image. So what we can do, we can start with the mean image and apply each of these eigenvectors individually. So this is our mean image here. And we can see what happens if we subtract a little bit of the first eigenvector or a lot of the first eigenvector or if we add a little bit of the first eigenvector or add a lot of the first eigenvector. So we m move along this direction of the first eigenvector. And what you see here is that the first eigenvector sort of tends to express age. So here we see a slightly younger version and as we move right, the picture gets older and older. The uh, second eigenvector is a sort of lighting thing, I think. Uh, the fourth I found particularly interesting. This seems to express uh, gender or a lot of the aspects of gender that we see in faces. So here you have a very male picture and here you have a slightly female picture. And the middle one, the mean face, is roughly neutral. I think a little bit more male because there are more men in the data set than, fe than women. But just by applying this picture at different levels, you can tune between male and female. We can also start with a random image from the data set and move in the direction of these eigenvectors and see what happens. So this is a slightly menacing looking man that I found in the data set, but it really did work best with this picture, so I decided to choose him. So here you get roughly the, the picture. And if you apply the first, you can see he gets a little bit older. If you apply the fourth, you can see, I think I can see from here properly. Uh, but he's, yeah, he looks sort of more female here and a bit more male here. And the last one is also interesting uh, because it, sh uh, it sort of expresses how much the mouth is open. So people don't have their mouth properly wide open, but some people have their mouth a little bit open and some people closed. So if you subtract this eigenvector a lot, you get a sort of grimace. And as you move to, as you add more and more and more of the eigenvector, the lips close until he's in sort of a kind of duck face mode, squeezing his lips together. And these are all linear transformations. All you're doing is just applying this picture in a certain scale. Um, and I've taken five more minutes of your time than I had, but I hope this was worth it. This is how you reconstruct, la uh, last slide, this is how you reconstruct a data point from the eigenvectors. So if you start with the mean image, you add the required amount of the first eigenvector, you end up here. This is the best approximation in one dimension we have of our image. You add the required amount of the second eigenvector, you end up here, and so on. So you pretty quickly go from the mean image to our guy. And then for the later eigenvector, remember we have huge numbers of eigenvectors, it very slowly converges to this. And this is after about 60 eigenvectors, you get this approximation. So I hope this explains why I put you through all the linear algebra with principal component analysis. Uh, if you want to play around with this, like I said, the code is on the GitHub. And I will see you uh, next week.